And who is my neighbor? That little five word question came from a man who plied Jesus with one in a seemingly endless flow of trick questions. But Christ had an answer for him, a story, a parable, which has resonated ever since right down here to today. Who is my neighbor? And who am I really supposed to love? They say the world loves a story, but Hollywood's back alleys are filled with scripts that got rejected, sitcoms that got canceled, and film stories that went into turnaround and never got made. And the reason some stories don't work is because they don't apply to how people live. Well, if there was ever a parable in the Bible which still works big time nearly 2,000 years after it was first told, this has got to be that story. The parable of the Good Samaritan, which answers the question, who is my neighbor? There are two stories in the book of Luke where a man asks Jesus Christ, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Here in chapter 10, and another similar anecdote in chapter 18. In that passage, Jesus says to the man, well, keep all of the commandments. Oh, I already do that, the ruler replies with a confident smile. Ever since I was a boy, is there anything else? Yes, Jesus tells him, sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come follow me, be my disciple. And the man goes away sad because he's a millionaire. Now here in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gives quite a different answer to what's essentially the same question. Consider this reply from Jesus and decide for yourself if this response is easier or harder. Actually, Christ knows that this man is trying to catch him in a verbal trap. The Bible says this expert in the law stood up to test Jesus in the King James Version, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Well, Jesus sees the trap a mile away, of course. So he wisely lets the man answer his own question. I'm reminded of the Jewish rabbi who was asked by a frustrated student, how come you teachers always answer questions with another question? And the aging wise one responds, so what's wrong with a question? But Jesus says to the man, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man gives this answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And that was a good answer, quoting directly from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. Jesus gives him an encouraging nod. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But think for a moment about the difficulty of this requirement. Maybe it seems soft to you, softer anyway than having a huge garage sale where you sell not only the things in your garage, but the garage itself and the house and the whole thing so that you can give everything to the poor. But are you and I and this John Grisham lawyer really capable of loving God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and all of our strength and of our mind? 110% commitment all day, every day? Is that something we can do? Are we coming close? And then to love our neighbor as ourself? Because Jesus wasn't just handing out a Hallmark card here, love your neighbor and hug a tree. He was actually saying this and meaning it. We have to love God with everything we've got, every fiber of emotion and heart and soul there is in us. And then we have to love our neighbor with that same intensity. In his book, Living Faith, President Jimmy Carter describes how back in the 1960s, he partnered up with a Cuban-American pastor named Eloy Cruz for a summer of witnessing. And this man had a passion for people, simple people, poor people, struggling people. He and Carter would sit in the kitchen of some home where the people had tremendous problems and challenges to face. And somehow, Pastor Cruz knew just the words to share 
the best way to explain his own love for them and for his savior, Jesus. Time after time, Jimmy Carter would see tears flow and people respond spiritually to that love. And this quiet, dynamic missionary pastor had a slogan that comes right out of this story. Love God, he would say, and the person in front of you. And in our Bible story, as this sharpie lawyer tries to jockey with Jesus a bit, pin him down with debating points, he's at a stalemate because he and Jesus agree on this answer. Love God with all of your heart. Love your neighbor with all your heart. Not that this man was accomplishing those twin objectives, you understand, but he knew how to give the textbook answer, and Jesus had given him an A. So, where should he go next? Well, this lawyer takes the easy way out. He asks another question, one which feeds right into the popular discussion of that era. All right then, Mr. Jesus, tell me this, he asks. Just who is my neighbor? Who do I have to be nice to? Who do I have to love? And you see, immediately there was a buzz of interest and approval because this was a point of constant coffeehouse debate in Israel. Who was your neighbor? Just the two families living on either side of you or everyone on your entire cul-de-sac? There were a couple of givens in society back then. If you were talking about the heathen, well, that wasn't even on the table. Non-believers weren't your neighbors. They weren't anything. Even Jesus called them dogs, or seemed to on one occasion at least. They're, they were of absolutely no account worth nothing, not worth anything. Nobody who'd graduated from kindergarten would even discuss that. And how about the Samaritans? Could they possibly qualify as neighbors? Not a chance. Not if they lived in your own backyard, which wasn't about to happen. The New International Version text notes for the Bible give us this bit of illumination. Jews viewed Samaritans as half-breeds, both physically and spiritually, a mixed-blood race resulting from the intermarriage of Israelites left behind when the people of the northern kingdom exiled and Gentiles brought into the land by the Assyrians. Speaking of spiritually, the Samaritans only accepted the Pentateuch as their Bible, rejecting all of the other writings held so dear by the Jews. There was a debate where the Samaritans had their temple on the wrong mountain, Gerizim, instead of on Mount Zion, which was, of course, the right and proper place to worship, and on and on it went. But no Jew with a brain in his head would consider that a Samaritan 10 miles away or 10 feet away was a neighbor worthy of decent treatment. They were the McCoys to Israel's Hatfields. And now Jesus launches into his story and we pick up the action in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. I've been on this road. It's the famous or infamous Wadi Kelt, which ran 17 miles from Jerusalem, 2,500 feet above sea level, down to Jericho at 800 feet below. So it was a rocky down, down, down journey with plenty of places for Jesse James gangs to hang out. In fact, this particular area, this ravine, was openly called the Valley of Blood. That's how it works out there for this anonymous crime victim. And then Jesus continues. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. These two men, obviously, were operating under the neighbor policy of the day. If I don't know you, forget it. Let the next guy dial 911 while I look out for number one. And now comes the punchline to the story. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. End of story. And Jesus takes a deep breath. Everyone in the crowd, kind of mad about the ending, takes a breath too and then rumbles a bit to the person standing next to them. Stupid story, what's he mean? And then Jesus leans in a bit to this lawyer. Which of these men do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the man couldn't even bring himself to say the dreaded S word, Samaritan. He just couldn't do it, even after a story like that. But he cleared his throat and reluctantly admitted, uh, the one who had mercy on him. You're right, Jesus said. And then these five archaic King James words, which ring with such power still today. Go and do thou likewise. Thank you.